The Michael H. Lord Gallery in Palm Springs is proud to support public television. Learn more about our paintings, photography, and sculpture at michaelhlordgallery.com or at our North Palm Canyon location. Michael H. Lord Gallery, an oasis of contemporary art since 1978. Thanks also to Palm Springs Life for 50 years, California's prestige magazine. The Palm Springs Air Museum, a nonprofit educational institution whose mission is to exhibit, educate, and eternalize combat aircraft and our veterans. In addition to flying aircraft, artwork, and library sources, perpetuate American history for future generations. The Camelot Theaters, bringing you retrospective documentary and art films, foreign and award-winning motion pictures. And the following supporters of public television and this program. Hi, everybody. You know, the arts abound in Southern California, both visual and performing arts. And no one has contributed more to the performing arts scene with popular music than Andy Williams with his magical voice. So stay with us as we talk to Andy and explore the arts. Where do I begin to tell the story of how great a love can be? The sweet love story that is over the sea. So no one hears us but the sky The vows of love we make will live until we die My life is yours ah. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan called Andy Williams' voice a national treasure. Andy has entertained us with that treasure for over a half century. And today, at 81, he shows no signs of slowing down. completed his autobiography, Moon River and Me, promoting it throughout Great Britain and the United States with book signings and personal appearances, he continues to perform to sold-out crowds at his 2,000-seat Moon River Theater in Branson, Missouri, returns to the West Coast for three performances of his popular Christmas show, December 18th, 19th, and 20th at the McCallum Theater in Palm Desert, California. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And along with his Emmy Awards, his 18 gold and platinum recordings, in 2009, Andy Williams was elected to the Songwriters Hall of Fame, only the second vocalist to receive that distinguished honor. The first was Tony Bennett. So how did little Andy Williams from a small town in Iowa grow up to become a mega star? We asked him during our interview at his home in La Quinta, California. I mean, I sang with my brothers forever yeah. from the time I was. Well, we started on the WHO in Des Moines when I was seven. Well, now, did, was, you, was your family in music? No, all? my father could play instruments, but mm -hmm. amateur, he could play about six or seven instruments. My mother could play the piano. And they started the, the uh, church choir, Presbyterian church choir. My mother and father and my two older brothers. That was it. And my brother Dick and I used to sing along when they had practiced the hymns. And then one day, uh, my father heard us, the four of us, singing together. And so four-part harmony, like the Eisman brothers when they first started. Or, um, and I think he saw his way to, uh, to get the hell out of Wall Lake through his sons. Uh -huh. You know, and... Um, so he moved from Wall Lake, took us all to Des Moines. Started on the radio in Des Moines on WHO. Um, about 10 years before that, Ronald Reagan was there. He was a sports announcer. His name was Dutch Reagan. And then we moved to Chicago, 
WLS, then we moved to uh, Cincinnati, WLW, then we moved to California. We got in some movies, the war came along, that ended all of that. How did you tie up with Kay Thompson? Well, that's what I'm saying. After the war was over, Kay was the head of the vocal department at MGM, and she was just uh, getting a divorce from her husband, Bill Spear, and she wanted to do an act. She wanted to do a singing. She used to be a singer, or what? And then she got into the, the music end of the, I mean, the vocal end of teaching other people to sing, Judy Garland and Lena Horne, and that. not that she taught them how, but she would coach them and, and uh, would write all of these wonderful things that they did. Anyway, she wanted to start an act, and, and she heard of us. And we started the act with Kay. And that lasted about five years. And then my brothers decided they wanted to do different, different things. My brother Dick wanted to sing with the band, which he did. He went with Harry James for a couple of years. And my brother Don wanted to be an actor. He tried that, and then he decided that he'd rather be an agent for an actor. Mm -hmm. And then he got in the agency business, and then now he's a manager. And my brother Bob wanted to get out of the whole thing. And he went into real estate, and in real estate with my father in the San Fernando Valley. And I was kind of left there. I was about, at that time, 21, and I had a high school education. I knew I could sing, and I figured I'd give it a shot. So I went to New York and struggled for about four years, and then finally got on Steve Allen Tonight Show as a regular and started making records. And then gradually things started to happen. I could be a guest on Dinah Shore's program, and I could be a guest on Perry Como's show. And when Perry's mother died, he asked me if I would take over his show. And, you know, it was only a couple of days, so I sang the songs that he was going to sing. And I did the lyric, I mean, I did the, the words that were on the teleprompter for him. He just crossed out. You know, every time I said Perry, I started talking. <laughs> but anyway, I, I eventually got a show of my own, you know. Did you study? singing at any time, take voice no, lessons? Because did. you have a beautiful voice, you still do, and you hit notes that are, you know, not every singer hits, and that's why your career has lasted so long, I'm sure. I don't know. I don't know, but I just know it that sounds the, awfully good. I don't, think, I don't think the Osmond brothers ever took any lessons yeah. either. You just, when you're a part of a group, you just sing. Yeah. You just sing and sing and sing, and the more you sing, the better you get. Working so long with his brothers gave him the background to perform with great ease with so many legendary performers during the nine years that his television show was an NBC favorite. He is one of those uh, singers who, who has a, a wonderful uh, love for, for all kinds of music. Uh, that's why he did so well in all these duets, is, uh, you name it, uh, and uh, he likes it and uh, he'll, uh, he'll sing it for you. Andy was fearless in terms of finding a, a genre of music. In other words, he would sing a country song, he'd sing a love ballad, he'd sing a, a kind of a big band jazz song, he would sing novelty stuff. Um, always able to, to make it his own. And it is this background and professional know-how that makes his performances at the Moon River Theater and touring shows so successful. While his book is Andy Williams, Moon River and Me, his theater, the Andy Williams Moon River Theater, and his restaurant, the Andy Williams Moon River Grill, his recording of Moon River almost never happened. And I didn't record that as a single. I, I, it had, 
I took it to the record company, to Archie Blyer, who was the head of the record company I was with then, which was Cadence. And he, you know, he was a wonderful, wonderful musician and a wonderful uh, record executive. And um, he said, I don't think this is a hit record because uh, I don't think kids will, will understand or buy My Huckleberry Friend. Mm. So he turned it down, and then it was a hit instrumental by, by uh, Henry. And then, then I was asked to sing it on the Academy Awards. Yeah. So I called Columbia, who I am now with Columbia, and said, I'm going to sing it on the Academy Awards in six weeks, and we all know it's going to win. Hmm. So why don't I go into an album called Moon River and other movie themes, and we'll have it ready by the time I sing it on the Academy Award. They thought this was a great idea. So we went in and quickly recorded uh, 11 songs. And they had, they did a great marketing job, marketing job. They had thousands and thousands of records in every record store. And the day after I sang it on the Academy Awards, they sold over 400,000 albums. Incredible. And at that time, that was a lot, you know, in 1962. Uh, and then it's been selling, you know, yeah. ever since. Wider than a mile, I am crossing you in the sky. Someday you dream, make you heartbreak. What prompted you finally to do the book? I'm sure you've been offered many times. It's called uh, Moon River and Me. Okay, now why? It's an autobiography. I've been asked a lot to do it, and um, my son Bobby, who's a filmmaker, he uh, knew a, a, a literary agent in London who he said is a terrific guy and very honest and well thought of, and he um, thinks that you ought to do a book that would do very well in England. So I said, well, okay, I thought about doing it, you know, for several years. But that, then I decided then I would. So I got with a writer uh, from England. Spent a lot of time here in um, Lakita and a lot of time in Branson. And uh, this book came out of that. I love your pre-Columbian art. I like, uh, I like all art. And I got interested in pre-Columbian art through Billy Pearson, who was an ex-jockey uh -huh. who uh, won $64,000 on the $64,000 question mm -hmm. as an art expert. You know, there are three very important people in, in, in the $64,000 question. I'm the most popular one. One was an uh, Italian shoemaker who knew all about opera. And then there was Billy Pearson who knew all about art. And then there was Dr. Joyce Brothers who knew all about the baseball statistics. Oh, they were the three most popular ones. Is that interesting? Anyway, okay, but you have a great collection. So this was me. this was a collection of, of uh, John Houston's collection. Oh, part of it. And then Billy, uh, was a very great friend of, of John's, and he said John is trying to get rid of everything that he has before he dies. He so said, you, you bought like, actually you like part of his collection. I saw this stuff, and I said, Yeah, I'd like to have it. The view is so beautiful outside. This figure, figure is, a oh. ra is a racetrack tout. And I got this in Hyannisport uh, when I was up visiting the Kennedys one time. And I, and I wanted to buy some shorebirds, because everybody on the East Coast has shorebirds. They're you know, little birds, and they have little stick legs and stuff, and, and some um, ducks. Uh -huh. So I went to this auction, and I, got to, and I bought some ducks, and I bought some shorebirds and stuff. But I got to know the, the um, auction, the guy who owned it, Bourne, Richard Bourne. And he said, this is a racetrack tout. <laughs> and it's, it has three different uh, layers of, of paint on it. And we got it down to this was the last layer, because it was red at one time, and it was black. And then, but anyway, this is the way it was. And I love that racetrack tower. Andy Williams is not only one of America's favorite musical artists, he is one of the world's great art collectors. And it is something that he shares with his public. Contemporary paintings line the walls of his theater. Jesus 
Rugs from his Navajo collection hang on a lower level hallway leading into the Performing Arts Theater. Happy day. while Japanese kimonos are framed on the theater's back wall. And a Henry Moore sculpture welcomes theater arrivals in the lobby. Is it any wonder that the Andy Williams Moon River Theater was highlighted in an issue of Architectural Digest, just as his home was several years earlier? Williams' fascination with pop art is reflected in the interior of the Andy Williams Moon River Grill. And I brought in a lot of art that I had of the of pop art, Andy Warhol and Lichtenstein and, and um, Robert Indiana and, and all those kind of... Were you always interested in those cats with modern art? I was interested in art always yeah. from the time I was young. And um, I didn't get into the pop art until later. You know, at first I didn't think Andy Warhol was, was much and I liked Lichtenstein right away. but. Anyway, I've gotten to appreciate these pop artists a lot. And I understand that you have quite a bit of art, both in the theater and the restaurant. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of pop art in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of modern you got art. You Campbell's Soup? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got the, oh, yeah, I've got all those. Yeah. Um, in fact, I had the series of the soup cans. And if you want to familiarize yourself with Andy's many gold records, you will find them hung over the cozy bar at the Andy Williams Grill. And art abounds at the Williams home in Branson, in the home and outside, where sculptures live peacefully among the beauty of the grounds. Andy even bought some unusual animal sculptures on a recent trip and placed them on land owned by the Williams across the street from their Branson home. Chattanooga, 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 Chattanooga. Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? Yes, yes. Track hey, won't you give me a shot? Can you afford to board the Chattanooga? And the Redford sings, I'll be blue Cause you don't want my love Some other time, that's what you say When I want you, then you laugh at me And make me cry, cause you don't want my love You don't seem to care a thing about me And well, I live without me, then I You know you are now spending so much time in Branson, and you have the Moon River Theater there. I presume that the first time that you went to Branson, you never suspected that you would move there, make a career out no, of I Branson? Didn't. No, my brother Don yeah. was in Branson first, and he, he was handling, he was managing Ray Stevens, and Ray Stevens opened a theater in Branson. And Don called me and he said, you really have got to come down here and see what's going on because it's 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 fantastic, it's it's all country, everything is country, and uh, uh, they have about four million people that come year round to see these country people, and they have about twenty theaters, and I thought, why do I want to go to Branson, you know, because I've been pretty much a Las Vegas kind of performer and and uh, traveling around the world doing tours and. You know, everywhere, Asia and, and a lot of a lot, a lot through the UK often, and in I'm Australia still. and stuff. No, no more. I'm through traveling. I'm through uh, uh, touring. But anyway, I, I went down as a favor, really, to my brother. And uh, uh, as often happens when when a performer knows that you're in the audience, he'll in, he'll introduce you. You know, and so I was introduced by Ray, and then after the show. Maybe 200 people came around wanting the autograph and then talking and somebody said, we never get to say you, we don't go to Vegas and we don't go to New York. Uh, why don't you come and sing down here? And then everybody was saying, oh yeah, and they clapped and things. And I got to thinking about it. I was really kind of burnt out about traveling all around mm -hmm. the world and about um, doing the same things over and over in, in, in Las Vegas and all of the gambling meccas. And suddenly it, it it came to mind that maybe this might not be a good, might be a good move to do. He said, you know, they have four million people here. If you just get 10% of them to come and see you, mm. you know, 400,000 people in a year, you'll pack your place. I got thinking about it, and then I uh, 
after a while, I, you know, I decided to do it and to build a theater. I was going to say, did you appear there to try it no, out I first didn't do before no, you built I was the theater? I was stupid. Uh, I mean, it turns out I wasn't stupid. But no. After I after I built this theater and spent a lot of money uh, yeah. building it, because I wanted it to be a state of the art theater, and so we did full out on it. Uh, and it's, it is a really beautiful. And it's a large theater. How many people does <clears> it? It's a large. It seats a little over two thousand. It's the only theater that Architectural Digest has ever featured. Um, they just don't do theaters. But I, had, I knew um, uh, Paige Rent. She had done a couple houses of mm -hmm. mine. And uh, I sent her some pictures of the theater. And, and lo, lo well, and behold, she did it. Who did you get to design it? <clears throat> it, was, uh, uh, it was designed by an architectural firm in, in Springfield. Huh. And, uh, but you knew what you wanted. Well, pretty much. Yeah. And and the the terrain, you know, there's everything is rocks, you know, everything's on a hill. So the the uh, property that I eventually bought was about twenty acres, right on the strip, the main strip, um, was very hilly, but everything was hilly. So we decided to build it on, you know, and and have three different lobbies. And the upper lobby were for people who were sitting more in the back at the mm -hmm. theater. And the regular first lobby was people are in the middle. And then the lower lobby were for, for the bus people, because the buses came by the hundreds. You know, we'd have 7,000 buses in one year at that Good time. Good heavens. Now, <coughs> yours was the first theater, and you, of course, the first star who was not a country star. Wasn't uh, well, it? yeah, I, that's true. And my brother was right. We did fill it up. We did. and. Uh, but after I had opened, you know, I got to think, what if I hadn't, what if this hadn't worked? Yeah, oh, I would have had a big theater to try and get right. rid of. Well, it just shows the pull that you have. We're going for a sleigh ride to bring good cheer again from the top of the chimney. You are going to do your Christmas show in California also. First you're well, doing I, it, well, aren't I you, in Brampton? I wasn't going to travel anymore. I wasn't That's going right. to do any more tours. And I mean it. I'm not going to because I've done enough. Then they're done that. Okay, but so, but well, she, my wife, okay. well, I got an offer to come again into the McCallum for three days, three nights, and Debbie found out about it. She said, "You've got to do it." I said, "Well, why do I got to do it? Why do I gotta?" And she said, "Well, we have all of our friends down there, and everybody wants to see, it, and it'd be fun for me to bring all the and play so golf here her. again." So that's why we're doing it. Ronald Reagan was right. Andy Williams' voice is a national treasure. That same Waiting round the bend My Huckleberry The Michael H. Lord Gallery in Palm Springs is proud to support public television. Learn more about our paintings, photography, and sculpture at michaelhlordgallery.com or at our North Palm Canyon location. Michael H. Lord Gallery, an oasis of contemporary art since 1978. Thanks also to Palm Springs Life for 50 years, California's prestige magazine. 
The Palm Springs Air Museum, a nonprofit educational institution whose mission is to exhibit, educate, and eternalize combat aircraft and our veterans. In addition to flying aircraft, artwork, and library sources perpetuate American history for future generations. The Camelot Theaters, bringing you retrospective, documentary, and art films, foreign, and award-winning motion pictures. And the following supporters of public television and this program.